Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. No matter how you buy your ag equipment, whether it's from a dealer, an auction, or a private party, AgDirect can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. TractorZoom has access to over $20 billion in heavy equipment sales data. TractorZoom's Iron Comps is the industry's trusted solution for transparent equipment values and auctionable pricing insights. This podcast is brought to you by Anvil AppWorks. The Dealer Connect CRMI app with integrated inventory management is an affordable Salesforce-based solution for your dealership. Create connected customer experience and transform how you work. Moving higher in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving higher time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Moving higher. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. I've got one of the guys I respect the most in this business, Sean Skaggs, on here to talk about what's going on in the marketplace. Sean, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, Casey. Uh, how are you? You know, it's uh, Christmas time. I like Christmas. I just don't like the things that happen around Christmas. So this is uh, this is one of those times of year I try to keep my head down and and uh, let my let my wife do the shopping. So. <laughs> I can relate to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm in kind of a take orders mood around Christmas time a yeah, lot too. That's that's where I'm at too, man. So yeah, it's one of those deals where you never know uh, quite exactly what you're going to get asked to do, and you might not want to do it, but sometimes you just have to take one for the team. I think, and 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 yeah, and move life forward. is going to be better in the long run if you just keep your head down and do what you're <laughs> that's, told. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Well, Sean, um, let's talk a little bit about parallel ag and. What it used to be. So last time you were on here, Sean, you were Livingston Machinery. Correct. And you've had a few changes since then. So talk a little bit about the the, the merger of the of the companies that you put together and, and what that looks like now. Sure. So, um, yeah, we've got a, a really interesting dealership set up. It's very non-typical, I would say. Um, uh, and the way that it came together is, you know, whenever I was CEO of Livingston Machinery Company, we were 100% employee-owned. So we were owned by an ESOP, and mm-hmm. uh, that ESOP was a great thing um, until we ran into the downturn of uh, you know 14, 15, 16. And then we got into some cash flow problems because of inventory problems like a sure. lot of people did. Yep. We ended up having to close a couple of stores. Whenever we closed those stores, uh, which was you know, a horrible thing uh, that uh, I still to this day hate even thinking about, but we did. We had to close a couple of stores. We had to let a lot of people go. And whenever we did that, because we were an ESOP, it created this new liability for us where we were going to have to pay those people for what they had earned through the ESOP within the next five years. And so uh, basically we were having to take all of the cash that we produced and save that back to be able to pay off that liability in the future. Mm -hmm. And we were at a point where we had a lot of opportunity to grow around us, but we couldn't take advantage of that opportunity because we didn't have any cash. I mean, growth takes cash, period. Right. Sure. And so, you know, we were having to save back that cash for that. So we decided we wanted to put that on the market, put the Livingston Machinery on the market um, to see if we could find some new partners to be able to come in and help us with that that cash problem and also to pay off everybody in the ESOP. And 
thankfully, uh, we found some great partners uh, who also happen to own uh, another dealership group called Ag Solutions Group. And um, so uh, in 2021, April of 2021, I guess it was, we went ahead and uh, sold the ESOP to Ag Solution Group Holdings. And at that time, I was able to buy in as a partner into Ag Solutions Group Holdings as well. And uh, so we then owned those two separate dealerships. We operated them separately for about a year and expanded them both in that time. And then uh, at the beginning of this year, we decided it was time to try and merge those together. And so in 20, you know, January of 2023, we became Parallel Ag, merging together Ag Solutions Group and Livingston Machinery Company, which Livingston Machinery Company is primarily an Agco dealership or was. Um, and Ag Solutions Group was a con- kind of a conglomeration of short line dealerships. Okay. And so, you know, selling everything from Apache sprayers to lots of uh, anhydrous toolbars mm-hmm. to, uh, you know, Polaris uh, equipment and, you know, all kinds of different things. Kinsey planters, just a lot of different short line dealerships. And so that, now that puts us in an interesting position because we are, you know, we have one of the main lines in our southern plain states, which is what, how we kind of designated the regions, which is Oklahoma, Texas, and Kansas, and then in Missouri, Iowa, and Minnesota, we've got short line dealerships up there. So okay. presents well, all kinds of interesting fit, challenges, though. but also a lot of diversity. Yeah. yeah. So you take a lot of your equipment, use equipment wise, and kind of move it around to those areas up north, and and kind of have the the power for the toolbar type of thing uh, going on. That's what that is. Honestly, that's the plan. We haven't mm-hmm. quite got that far yet. We're just now starting to do a little bit of that. And our plan mm-hmm. for 2024 is to do a lot more of that because that's one of yeah. the reasons why we wanted to merge them together is to yeah. give us a bigger platform to move a lot of that used equipment. Yeah. Well, at least you got, you know, you can get more eyes now. You can spread it around and you can, you can move stuff all over the place now because you can, because, yeah. you know, hook it on a truck and drive it up there. And that, that's the cool part about some of the stuff too. When you see these, um, some of these dealer consolidations that you're seeing where they're they're you know not next to each other they're a few miles away taking taking advantage of the diversity that comes with that you know what i mean absolutely so, i mean a great example of that would be this you know in 2022 we had pretty extreme drought in texas and oklahoma mm-hmm. and but you know the midwest was having pretty good times good crops good uh, good weather and uh, so our park sales fell way off in oklahoma and texas um but They were really good throughout the Midwest. And then this year, we've seen drought in the Midwest, and park sales fell off up there. But we had wet weather in Oklahoma and Texas for the most part. We still got parts of Texas that are still in a drought. But but for the most part, had good weather down there. And so those park sales just flip-flopped. And so they offset each other. That diversity has really helped us out in that way. Yeah. It's amazing watching that work because then it opens up. And then you get to different schools of thought that come along with that, too. I mean – you got two dynamically different regions that do things dynamically different and and machine specs are got to be something now that you're looking at when you're looking at how you're specking something new coming out of Oklahoma, Texas and then how how that's how those specs echo in Missouri, Minnesota and Iowa. I mean it's it's a different it's a different animal out there. It is. It is. And that's that's another great thing is it's given us an opportunity to learn a lot from each yeah. other and we've got yeah. a lot of very diverse expertise now throughout the company and so we're, we've been working on that for the last year, trying to spread that all the way across the company. Um, but we're going to be continuing to work on that for years because there's so much to do there, so yeah. much uh, to learn from each other. Yep, and it's going to continue to have that that opportunity to to, to flex and grow and and merge and and diverge and everything else that comes with that because it's just a it's a great thing. So this is something I get asked. Like I've had this question asked to me I don't know how many times, but. You'll see this come up when a an acquisition or a merger or something like that comes along in, of a dealer group. And the biggest question that I get out of this is that, man, I've lost my ability to um, have any kind of competition. And, I mean, in the, sh- in the short term, it, the answer is, oh, yeah, you have. Because now you have, instead of having three dealers to work against you, you know, work against each other, you have one or two or whatever the number is. I think that's... That's some short-term thinking, in my opinion, right? I think when you're when you're uh, uh, as a producer looking at what's going on now, you now have access to more resources than the, each one of those three dealerships could give you combined, right? Now you had, um, I think, technology is probably the easy one to pick on here, right? So if you're a single store dealership out there and you had a technology expert, um, that's not all they did. That was 
that was such a small part of their job because they were probably doing something with service or doing something in sales or something like that, and they were getting pulled in a million different directions. Jack of all trades, master of none type scenario. Where now, if you have like this scenario you're in, where you have a bigger, um, broader base, a bigger balance sheet, all the stuff that comes with that, um, now you have the opportunity to add one or two guys into the mix that are full time technology people that can spend the time learning and training on the latest cutting edge technology that they can then bring back to to the dealership and to those customer bases. Talk about that a little bit, Sean, and and, and how you're seeing some of those economies of scale work for you. Well, you're exactly right. I mean, whenever you talk about that uh, jack of all trades, master of none, I relate to that a lot. I remember back whenever we were just two stores as Livingston Machinery Company, and yeah. I was the precision ag specialist for one of those stores, but I was also the general manager at that store. Yeah. I was performing the sales manager duties. Um, I was also the IT manager at that store. I also handled all the walk-in sales, and I handled all the marketing and advertising and uh, yeah. and whatever else got thrown at us that nobody else wanted to do. That was my job, and I was a precision ag specialist. So yeah. I wasn't very good at any of those things because I was trying to do yeah. all of them at the same time. And so, yeah, that, that's exactly right. And that's one of the things that we want to do you know, as we continue to grow is to really be able to scale that up. The technology team is a perfect example because we all know that we're getting more and more technology in our machinery, not less. Right. And so it's become, becoming more and more important. The technology is able to do more. Um, you know, we're at a point where very soon we're going to have to have teams of people that all they do is sit there and watch those monitors to see what's happening in our customers' machines Yeah, to, to, so that they can then notify that customer, hey, your machine has a problem. We think it's this. We'd like to send out a technician. You know, is it all right if we go ahead and send out a technician to go and fix that machine? And they might not even know their machine's down yet um, yep. because their operator may not have called them. Uh, their operator may not be paying attention to what the machine's doing, too. You never know what the situation might be. And so, uh, yeah, we're we're not very far from having to have that. And it's a whole lot easier to do when you can spread that cost across 12 stores than it is whenever you have to spread it across two stores. Yeah. Um, So that's a great example. But it it goes for employee benefits and things as well, because we all know the struggle is real whenever you're trying to hire good people out there. Yeah. And um, the more scale you have, the more you can offer those people, not only in the way of benefits, but also in the way of opportunity so that they have an opportunity to be able to move up through a company because really high quality people, they want the opportunity to improve themselves. Yep. And I think that's a good point too, is that as again, as the the economies of scale take place and you start looking at things that happen, positions get created that you never even thought you'd ever even have. Right. And, um, you know, whether you're looking at whatever it is, you know, there's a lot of things out there that pop up that guys just didn't have. You, you, like your example, when you were Manager, technology specialist, you know, part-time HR. I mean, you were like everything in the mix all at one time. I mean, sooner or later, you just get to a point where nothing's getting accomplished, and you're not, and you're just spinning your wheels going in, going nowhere. And the yeah, employees kind of feel those that. people that are having to, the people that are having to do that are getting burned out. Yes. And yes. so then you end up losing a lot of your really good knowledge and experience that they've accumulated. Yep. You end up losing those people because they get burnt out and they're looking for something where they're not having to do everything in the dealership. Right. Not everything's coming at them at one time type of thing. And that's, that's a, that's a, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about there. It's been a, uh, it's been a fun, a fun journey watching, watching you guys grow, Sean. So I, I look forward to seeing what, what the future brings for you guys on that, on that front. Oh, thanks, Casey. I appreciate it. We're we're having a good time ourselves. Um, you know, trying to really build something that's going to be great for our customers and great for our employees as well, and and for our investors. Yep, for sure. All right, let's talk about the fun stuff. All right, we got we got the old used equipment marketplace, and the we're coming out of twenty three here, which I still think twenty three. When I mean, we only got what two weeks left of twenty three or whatever it is, but twenty three has been a, a very uh, transitional year i think is the best way to put it we watched coming out of 22 the the amount of equipment that was um still backlogged into uh the factories and then that first quarter of the year they seemed to manage to get all of it out at the same time and kind of get it put where it needed to go which then brought in all the used trades that were out there i think the the i think the, if i'm going to put a storyline to 2023 is it was it'd be something like uh i didn't realize we sold so much uh because it was one of those deals where you had all these deals going, you had everything coming, this stuff was kind of trickling in and, and you didn't really kind of see, you knew it, but you didn't. And then all of a sudden it shows up and then you get all this stuff back in. 
and now we kind of got the market in the point now where we got this i don't supply is cotton up with demand i guess is probably the best way to put it yeah. sean as you're looking at inventory around you and in the areas that you cover what are your thoughts and and how do you see this inventory issue kind of shaking out into 24 well, um, just being completely transparent, Casey, I've been that guy standing on the corner preaching gloom and doom for the last two or three years. <laughs> and I think right. this next year's the year I might Win. find you right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried to be too conservative on that front uh, rather than not conservative enough because of what we did go through back in 15 and 16. Yeah. We don't want that to happen again. Sure. Um, and then when we thought we had everything in perfect shape to be able to handle it whenever the market changed. And then, like you said, then all of a sudden, all the manufacturers caught up at once and all yeah. this inventory came in at once. And so then all the trade-ins came at once. And uh, so now we are we are in a situation where we've got a lot of inventory on hand, both used and new, but especially um, used because that's always the bigger concern because when how that market can change sure. so fast. And so uh, that's definitely a concern. We're trying to you know do some things to, to help prepare for that. Uh, even in the face of that, we've got actually – a lot of equipment that's at auction today that's going to close today. And uh, it'll be really interesting to see how that stuff does at auction. And it's been a mixed bag as I've kind of watched it over the last couple of days. Some stuff's doing better than what we thought it would. Yep. And some is doing not nearly as well as we thought it would. It just depends yep. on the piece. And so that's going to be fun to watch. But yeah, coming into this next year, I just think we're going to see a market change. Um, like I said, I've been the guy preaching gloom and doom for a long time, but at the same time, I think this year, you know, I don't think it's going to be really gloom and doom. I don't think that we're headed into a disaster by any means. But I do think we're going to see a shift because, like you said, supply is caught up with demand. Um, I think we're going to see, you know, new sales come down some. And as a, as a result, new sales come down some. But I don't think it's a – we're not running into something like we did back in 15 and 16 where people were scared to even repair their machines. Right. Because we yeah. really did have a lot of that where producers would just – run the machine until the wheels literally fell off mm -hmm. uh, rather than fixing anything because they were just afraid to spend that cash. You know, can't blame them for that. It was a, it was a really tough time, but the, you know, parts sales and service sales fell off dramatically back then. And I don't expect that to happen right now. People are sitting in uh, better shape financially than what they were at that time. Their balance sheets look a lot better. And I think that uh, they're still going to be running good operations. They just may be running it with a little bit longer trade cycles than what they've had for the last two or three years. Yep. And I'd agree with you on that. So I've got, I got, a, I'd, I'd have a lot of these uh, hair brain schemes that pop up in my head from time to time and more, more times than they probably should. But um, so I've been thinking about this for a while and I've, I've wrote a couple articles about it and it's, I've kind of just watching how, how the last two or three years have, have impacted the producer from the perspective of hey here's how much a new one costs now and here's how much a used one costs now <clears throat> as i'm looking at the customer base it really feels like to me that they're really solidified into these you know more of a traditional um block of buyers right so you got the the new guy then you got the one to two year old guy then you've got the three to five year old guy and you know so on and so forth down the line um and it feels like they're stuck in these boxes and they can't, you know, they're, they're financially, they are, I can afford to buy this machine and I can trade this machine in and I can't really go either way. If I go backwards, I'm, I'm buying something that I'm trading in. If I go too much for more forward than I need to, I'm into something that's going to put me into some kind of a risk situation. As you look at this, Sean, are you, do you feel like that a little bit that you're seeing some like these buying groups? Cause, cause to me, I feel that's, it's almost it's a good thing in the sense of now you know who's going to be buying your used equipment and it should be a lot more predictable than in the past. But to your point earlier, their, their, their trade cycles are getting longer, right? Um, but I guess as you look at your customer base, do you, are you feeling some kind of solidification of these buying groups out there? I think we've seen that over the last couple of years, um, mm -hmm. or over the last, really it's three, four or five years. Yeah. Um, However, I'm what I'm curious about is what's going to happen in this in, in this next phase of the market cycle, right? right? Because not only do you have the market changing, you know, where mm -hmm. you know commodity prices are lower, in, some inputs have gotten lower, some inputs have gotten higher. Just depends on what it is, but they're they're being squeezed a little bit more, so they've got more pressure on them going into this next year. And at the same time, equipment has gone up thirty, forty percent over the last two or three years. And so I, I'm wondering if there's not going to be some people that question, okay, this is what I've been able to afford in the past, but right. what can I afford to buy now 
because the prices have changed so much. Right. Um, you know, and that's going to be more so on probably the new side than on the used side because those markets, you know, the what the excuse me, I'm trying to say this the right way, the value of the used equipment will flow somewhat with sure. those pressures. Yep. Um, but uh, on the new side, you know, it's it could push some people down into used, and at the same time, it, maybe that pushes that guy who was the second tier buyer down into the third tier, uh, depending on what's available, depending on, you know, what the market does and those kind of things. So I'm, I'm curious as to how that will shake out and, and whether people will, will change dramatically on that or, or make little adjustments, or maybe they make no adjustments at all. I'm, I'm, I'm not a guru who really knows exactly what's going to happen. I'll leave that up to you, but, uh, <laughs> You're I, brave. I've, seen, I've seen those, uh, seen those cycles or, or those blocks that they're in change in the past, yeah. Whenever we've had cycle changes like this, and so I think it's possible we could see that again. But I, I, my crystal ball is not good enough to know exactly how that's going to shake out. Yeah. As you're looking at your customer base now, um, I, I talk about this generational crossroad thing quite a bit um, on here, meaning that we are at a point now where you have the the generational farming operations that do have that next generation coming in, and they might have two or three families, you know, of that generation inside that, inside that farming operation right now, uh, bringing in maybe the fourth in some situation. Um, then you also have the guys on the other side of that coin that don't have anyone coming back to the farm and they're they're That's where it stops. What is the competition right now look like in the areas that you're, that you're dealing with as far as, um, are you starting to see some, some cash rent stuff? really start to pick up? Are you starting to see guys talk more about, um, you know, I need to find that next thousand acres type of thing? Like what, what are some of the conversations that you're hearing from your folks when it comes to this kind of, I need to grow it because I got someone else coming back into the operation? Well, um, you know, to be honest with you, I haven't had enough of those conversations lately to be able to say I'm an expert on it by any means, but yeah. from, from what I'm seeing, I think there's been so much consolidation in a lot of the area that I travel normally mm-hmm. uh, over the last few years that we're kind of getting down to the point where you you've just got your big players left. There's there's yeah. a few little ones out there, but they're you know they're really more the weekend warrior types. There's not as many of the small and medium sized farms. I mean, my dad is still uh, what I would consider like a, a medium sized farmer in our area, and he's in his mid sixties, mm-hmm. and he's trying to figure out what comes next because I dove off into the equipment business because whenever I was 18 years old, dad said, look, you better go to college because there's not enough land for you to come back here and farm and for us to support another family on this. And so Mm -hmm. I think there was a whole, you know, of course that was in the, you know, the mid nineties. And I think there was a whole generation of us that got told that same speech uh, there in the mid nineties and got kind of pushed off the farm. And then, you know, five to 10 years later that it got good enough that uh, kids could start coming back on the farm again. But, um, so I think you, you do have some, a lot of those farmers that are going to be in transition and then, they're trying to figure out what to do. Their families are going to be trying to figure out what to do um, as that comes about. And obviously it's, it's going to end up with some kind of consolidation to some of these really big farms, the ones that have really taken advantage of that over the last few years and, and grown and got the scale that it requires to be able to afford new equipment now to be able mm-hmm. to afford to, uh, to hire people and offer them benefits and do things like that. It's, it's been an interesting transition to try and watch, um, but yeah, I don't. I, I, again, I'm I'm not an expert on it. I need to get out and and talk to more of those folks about those kind of things. But I haven't had some of those conversations lately. Yeah, yeah it's it's interesting to watch how to say it, and this is not the right way to put it, but it's the only way I know how to because I'm a simpleton. But the farming has become a a big business. You know what I mean? It's not um, the the economies of scale like you're talking about. Uh, on both sides of the of the fence, right? And you've got some of these guys out there now are looking at it from a perspective of, all right, so I'm big enough now to where I can support two legitimate technicians to come in and, and work on my farm, right? I can support my own technology person now and those kind of things. They're starting to look at it from the perspective of, hey, this, this is, I'm in, I have a multi-million dollar business that I operate. It just happens to be in agriculture and that, that mindset's starting to flip a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we have, and that's been another thing that, uh, as you mentioned that I was thinking about a lot is we do have a lot of farms that have developed in that way. And it's, it's been interesting to see how big they actually get because a lot of them do have their, you know, they've got their own team of technicians that all they do is work mm-hmm. on equipment all day, every long. They've got their own technology people. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to deal with more and more, 
uh, farms that are that size, whether that be you know what gets termed as the big corporate farms, although even most of the corporate farms are still owned by a family They're somewhere. Owned by a family, yeah. And uh, or you know we deal with a lot of custom operators too, in uh, yeah. especially in Texas and in Oklahoma, but you know out in West Texas, there's a lot of really big custom operators out there that you know they've got an operation that's almost as big as ours is, mm-hmm. and uh, you know so you're dealing with some of those uh, folks there that you know it's just it's just different what they're able to uh, what they're able to do and what they're able to offer, and at some point they're going to have a, a business that they're going to be able to put on the market and possibly sell if they don't have somebody to transition that to. Yep, for sure. It's going to be interesting to watch that how that whole thing kind of turns into what it becomes. So, all right, Sean, last thing here. As you uh, as you prepare yourself to look at um, how your your parallel ag becomes um, what the new parallel parallel ag becomes, what are what are what are two of the biggest things that you have that are on your mind right now that you're that you're really trying to focus on going into twenty four to help kind of make that transition happen? Um. Well. You know, we're focused on a lot of things. So as far as preparing for 2024 right now, we're really focused on our inventory controls, making sure that we are, you know, buying inventory correctly, making sure that we're ordering inventory correctly, uh, making sure that we're managing that process really closely uh, mm-hmm. so that we can keep our turns as high as possible because that's one thing that's going to be really important for equipment dealers to do over the next couple of years. Yes. Um, and then on the other side of that, um, you know, the thing that I'm focused on every day is, you know, culture and strategy um, because, you know, I, I'm a strategy guy. I love strategy, but culture eats strategy for breakfast. That saying will right. ring true 100% of the time. Yep. And so, uh, you know, as we grow and as we scale, it's really important to us that we keep our culture uh, based around customer service, based around treating each other like family, based around it feeling like a family owned business, even though we're large and we're spread out across six states. And right now we're still accomplishing that, but that's going to get more and more difficult the, the bigger the company gets. And so that's where I put a lot of my focus is on people, strategy, culture, you know, and then and then working a lot on acquisitions so we can continue to scale up so that we can compete with a lot of the other large organizations that are out there in terms of what we can offer our customers and what we can offer our employees. Right. Well, that's awesome, Sean. Like I said earlier, you're one of the one of the few guys in this business I really have a lot of respect for, man. And, and Sean, I, I, you've done a great job at Livingston Machinery and now pulling this uh, parallel act thing together. You've done, a, you've done a great job there, and I look forward to watching you continue to grow. Thanks, Casey. I appreciate it. You're uh, one of the guys that I really respect in the business as well and have enjoy, always enjoyed our conversations that we've had over the years. And yeah. always, uh, always get a smile on my face whenever I see you. Whenever I saw you come in the room the other day, I was surprised to see you, but yeah. – uh, but you probably saw I had a big smile on my face. I was like, oh, there's my buddy Casey. We're going to yeah. have some good conversations now. Yep. Yeah, that was that was really cool to see you there too, man. So we will continue to work together and uh, look forward to seeing you more in 24, man. All right. Thanks, Casey. Sean, if people want to reach out to you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, well, I am not on social media, so sean.skaggs at parallelag.com. That's it. That's good, man. You're you're one of the smart ones, so good job, buddy. <laughs> okay. Right on. <laughs> Appreciate you, man. We'll, t- we'll catch you again here. I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC, LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast, Snapchat, and TikTok at Moving Iron Podcast. And then you'll see the video version over on the YouTube channel, which is the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. Go to Moving Iron LLC for everything Moving Iron related, and uh, we'll catch you again in 24. So with that, I'm Casey Seymour with Sean Skagg. Let's go move some iron, folks. Out. When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, We have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. 
Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. No matter how you buy your ag equipment, whether it's from a dealer, an auction, or a private party, Ag Direct can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. TractorZoom has access to over $20 billion in heavy equipment sales data. TractorZoom's Iron Comps is the industry's trusted solution for transparent equipment values and auctionable pricing insights. This podcast is brought to you by Anvil AppWorks. The Dealer Connect CRMI app with integrated inventory management is an affordable Salesforce-based solution for your dealership. Create connected customer experience and transform how you work. Moving higher in the 21st century. Hard work. 